Hello and welcome to C Programming Zero to Neural Networks. Today we are building uh, an AI for our snake game. Uh, not the most complicated of AI, but it will work and it will be able to play the game. So um, how the AI is going to work is sort of explained in this picture here. We, uh, the, the snake at any given time is in a state and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to test to see if going left is the best direction to go in or going straight forward is the best direction to go in or going right is the best direction to go in because they're the three options we've got we can't go back on ourselves even though we've got four directions at any point we've got a choice of three directions we can go and we're going to decide that based on a reward system uh, so we've like in this example here if this left if that if that was in a wall we definitely don't want to go that way and if this is an apple here, we definitely want to turn and go and get the apple. So that's how it's going to work. And it's actually quite an effective um, way of building an AI for a snake game. Strangely enough, um, a neural network doesn't really do much better unless we um, give some awareness of not trapping our tail. And as we're going to discover uh, as we progress through this, um, through this part, is that that's the most difficult problem to try and solve when it comes to building an AI to play snake game. I've quite enjoyed working on AI snake for the uh, for the last week or uh, whatever I've been um, been experimenting with it and uh, this is the simplest method and it's also one of the most effective. So we're going to build it here today. So let's get started. First of all, uh, let's recap what we had before. So we've built well, should we make and run it? Yeah. So we've got this snake game. We made this in a previous video called Build uh, Snake in C. Uh, Bill Snake in C, I think I called it. And we can play Snake. And um, we crash and we die. We crash into ourselves. And we need to be a bit longer to crash in ourselves. But you get the idea. It's got the basic rules of Snake. If we get an apple, we the Snake gets longer and we generate another apple. Nice and simple. We all know what the Snake game is. Let's crash into ourselves. There we go and we died. So how we did it was we made a... Um, a linked list of snakes and we just render render the snake on a grid and we render an apple on a grid it's all quite a straightforward program um, we've got an increase snake function we've got a move snake function we've got a reset snake function a render snake function render grid gen apple um, render apple detect apple detect crash and a main function which sort of uh, initializes stl we use an stl as our graphical environment and uh, we detect key presses to change our direction and we've got a there's a render loop at the bottom here, which actually needs to be indented, doesn't it? We should have done that, shouldn't we? Right, and save that. So we're gonna we're gonna make it an AI. So first of all, I'm gonna leave that out here. So I'm gonna make it an AI directory, and I'll copy everything from that directory into this directory. So we've got a copy of the game. We'll go back to where we were. What we need to play the game is an AI function, don't we? We need a function that does all the moves for us, and we're just going to call it AI because I'm not feeling very creative. <laughs> so we can make a void AI. And uh, it's a void function, so it's not going to return anything. So how is this function going to work? How are we going to, how are we going to make this happen? Well... What we need, we've got three states that we want to try. We want to test out and figure out a reward for each of those states. So we're going to need an int try forward, and that's going to have to equal something. Int try left, and that's going to have to equal something. Int try right is going to have to equal something. And then the entire AI is just going to figure out what's the best move out of them. So we can do if try forward is greater or equal to try left and try try forward is greater or equal to try right we're gonna continue continue forward don't like right in capitals continue forward else we're gonna do either go left or right aren't we so if try left is greater than try right we're gonna no, it's not try right, it's try R, isn't it? We're going to turn left. Else we're going to turn right. So that's the entirety of the AI. That's what's going to power our snake AI. This one sort of, you can't really call it an algorithm, can you? It's, uh, it's just a sort of a, um, a series of ifs. 
So first of all, we haven't got a turn left or a turn right function in our snake game. We've got arrow keys, which just change the direction. So we're going to need to make a turn left and a turn right function. So let's start by doing that. Let's begin by doing that. It, these are going to be quite simple. Void turn left. So what do we need to do to turn left? We're going to have to switch on the head direction so we have a, a head um, which is also or is a pointer to um, the first element in the linked list which is always going to be that so it's always pointing to the head and each segment of the snake has a direction and the head direction is the one that decides the direction the snake's going in obviously and uh, we have some enumerated values we have case snake up case snake down case Snake. Let's put a break there, aren't we? Case, base, case, snake, left, and finally, case, snake, right. So they're the, the values we've got um, enumerated for our directions. So if we, if we want to figure out uh, a, t a left turn is going to be different depending on the direction we're going, isn't it? So if we're going up a left turn, we change to turning left. We change the head dir to be head dir equals snake left. So that's nice and simple. What about if we're going down? We're going to have to do the opposite, aren't we? If we're going down and we're making a left turn, we're going to end up going right. Right. And then if, if we are going left and we make a left turn, we're going to end up going down. And if we're going right, we make a left turn, we're going to end up going up. So this needs to be snake up, doesn't it? So if we're up, we go left. If we're down, we go right. If we're left, we go down. And if we're going right, we go up. We have to make sure we get these right. Otherwise, obviously, none of this is going to work. So, so that is our turn left function. So we need another one of these, don't we? We need, um, we can just copy that and change that to a turn right so obviously if we're going up we now need to be going right if we're going down we're going to be going left we can just reverse these up down just make sure that's right if we're going if we're heading in the right um, and then we make a right turn we're going to be pointing downwards so that's our turn left and turn right so we can get rid of these comments and we can change turn left turn right it's all indented nice we may as well make sure we've not made any silly errors yet right okay and then all we've got left to do now to make this ai work is find some way of calculating um our values for try forward try left and try right so um going back to the picture so um in this state in the state the snake's in well, we're moving towards the apple, so that's a good thing. So we can give a small reward for moving towards the apple. We're not about to hit any wall, so we don't need any sort of negative rewards for, for hitting any wall, so any walls or anything. So the best thing to do is in this situation, in this picture, is probably just to carry on going forward. Um, we need a way of figuring this out, don't we? And this is all based on the state of the game. So we need a function that we ideally need to call state, which is going to return an integer based on the state if we did move forward and the state if we did move left and the state if we did move right and ideally we don't want to have like um zeros and ones representing lefts rights ups and downs so we're going to need another enumerator so we do enum and we'll put try forward try left and try right and we've got three different enumerated values. If you're not sure what an enumerator is, it just turns these words that we've made into values that we can use, that we can switch on and do those kinds of things. It's a bit more descriptive than using just zero, one, and two, like zero representing forward, one representing left. At least we've got a descriptive name for each. And then we can, so for try forward, if we want to pass try forward, and then we want to pass try left, and then we want to pass try 
Right, and these are just integers, but integers represented as numbers, hence an enumerator. That's what an enumerator is. It enumerates um, some word. So we need to make our state function. So this needs to be an int function because it's going to be returning an int. State return, and we're going to return a reward. And we're going to need to make that reward. And we're going to initialize it as zero. So we need to pass try to that so these get accepted by the state function so that's setting up our state function now so at the moment if we run this obviously we're always going to be returning a zero so the ai is not actually going to do anything it's going to do the same thing every time i've spelt try forward wrong that looks right try forward and declared i spelled out missed an r haven't i so it's not going to do anything the ai is just going to continually crash into these walls no matter which direction we go or whether we get the apple. So that's not very good AI at the moment, so let's make it better. So the first thing we need to do is we've got two situations here. In our state function, we could be going left, we could be going right, we could be going up, we could be going down. And so a try forward is going to, we want to move the head position forward one, but that's different depending on what direction we're going to go. So we're going to need a big switch statement to uh, sort of modify these values. So we're going to need to switch on the head direction once again. And then we're going to obviously have to have case snake up, down, left and right but we're also going to have to switch on what we're trying on whether we're trying to move forward and trying to move left or we're trying to move right so we're going to need another switch in each of these and we can put uh, try forward no try we're switching on the try value of past and we're going to put case try forward last one and we need try left and we need try right so we're going to end up with quite a big switch statement here which is it's doing a very simple thing but it's just we've got all these different cases we've got different directions and then different things we're trying with each of those directions and we're going to have to do that for every single one of them aren't we so we need to do um eight eight y y b p now let's make sure I've not missed any uh, brackets. No, I haven't. So what are we going to do? We're going to we want to see what the head position is like if we moved it forward one and calculate some kind of reward. So we don't want to actually move the head. So we're going to need a copy of the head, aren't we? So what we're going to do is we're going to do an int try x equals head x position and int try y equals head y position. And then we're going to modify one of these for each of these cases, aren't we? So if we're heading up, let's draw this out just to make sure this is clear. So we don't need better color than that. So the game happens on a grid and let's get rid of that. So and we start at zero, zero, and then we down there to grid size. And down there to grid size and um, so if a head position is here it could be at like three three so if we want to see what it's like if we're, if we're heading upwards and we want to see um, what its position will be there we have to minus one off the y position simple and if we're moving it in this direction so if we've got a head here and we're moving in this direction a forward is going to have to increase um, the x position by one, so it's got three plus one equals four x equals, and this is y equals. So it's different, but we have to, a forward direction is different depending on the direction we're moving in. And all we're doing is, is either changing the y value, the head y value, or the head x value, depending on the direction we're moving in. And if we're, if we're doing try left, we have to move a different direction. We have to do, so if uh, the snake is, if the snake is in that direction we want to try left we need to figure out what this position is and we're doing a try right we need to figure out what that position is try forward you figure out what that position is and each one is just a case of minusing one off either the y the head x or the head y 
So on this, we're going up, so we need to uh, minus one off the head X to, to figure out, to, to, to land in this position here. It'll make sense, it'll make sense. So try forward, so we're heading up, and we want to try forward, so we want to move the head position one more up. And because we start at zero at the top, we want try Y minus minus. And if we want to try left, we're heading up and we're going to try left, we want X minus minus. So we want try X minus minus. And trying right is try X plus plus. So that'll modify these copied values for the up case if we're going up um, to, to the try cases. Probably not the best explanation, but I'm sure you get the idea of what we're doing here. We're creating a copy of the head and moving it into the position. We're creating a copy of this head and move it into the, that position, that position, or that position. Each time we run this state function based on the try parameter we've passed. So snake down. Again, we've got to get these exactly right, otherwise none of this is going to work. So we're heading downwards and we want to try forwards. So we need to add one on the Y position. So try Y plus plus. We're heading down, we want to try left. So we're going down and we want to try left. So we want um, try X plus plus, don't we? They're heading, and then we take a left turn. Oh, wait, we're trying a left turn. So we're increasing the X by one. And that means that this is going to have to be the opposite to that, which is going to be try X minus minus. So there's two of them done. <laughs> this is probably the most trickiest bit of the whole thing. <laughs> Um, so if we're heading left and we want to try forward, we want a, no, sorry, that's left, isn't it? We're heading left, we want a minus one off the x, so we want to try x minus minus. Uh, if we're heading left and we want to try left, that's going to point us downward, so we want to try y plus plus. And if we're heading left and we want to try turning right, that's going to be try y minus minus. If you're not sure what all this is doing here, if you just draw the state grid out, it'll make sense. If you, I mean, my scruffy example there probably doesn't, you, you probably can't even read it. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a simple concept. It's just a big function because we've got so many cases to worry about. So finally, the case right. So we're going right and we want to try forward. So we want an X plus plus. Try X plus plus. And if we're heading right and we want to try going left, so that's the left turn, we're going to end up going up, try y minus minus. And that means that this has got to be try y plus plus, but I check that. We're heading right, and we take a right turn, so we end up pointing downwards. So, yeah. Let's hope I've done that right. Let's hope that works. Let's make sure we've got no compiler errors. Yeah, we're all right. So what we're going to do is, now we've done that, we've done the hard work. So now we're going to fit, try and stop the snake from crashing into the walls, which is going to be two if statements. We're going to do if try x is less than zero. So if our attempted move has moved us outside the boundaries of the grid in, in the minus direction, or try x is greater than grid size minus one, because when you render up to the grid size, we're going to do reward plus equals minus 100. So we're going to give a big negative reward for hitting the wall, because obviously we don't want to do that any ever, do we? And we're going to do the same thing for the y coordinate. Right, all being well, our snake will survive. It survives. Let's make sure it happens in all cases. We've got ourselves a snake that actually survives. It's not a very clever AI yet because it's got no interest in getting the apple, but um, we can, I mean, we can fix the apple thing very quickly. So we can do if um, try x equals apple.x and try y equals apple.y. So if the, if, the coordinates we're trying are the same as the apple coordinate. We can just give a reward, can't we? The reward plus equals positive 100. Now, it's not going to move towards the apple, but if we just happen to end up next to it, we, we collect the apple. It does it automatically. Well, if you head straight for it, it obviously gets it anyway. There we go. Turns on its own. Turns on its own. Turns on its own. So there we go. We've got we've got the beginnings of an AI, haven't we? It's almost playing the game. Right. So 
Next, we want to move towards the apple. Let's label these with some comments. So we want to um, detect wall crash. Call this detect apple, and then we need to move towards apple. We're going to need more than an if, aren't we? So if we want to move towards the apple, what we want to do is figure out if our try position, the position we've just moved to, is closer to the apple than the original position. So we're going to need four values, aren't we? We're going to need an int diff x, int diff y, which is the, the, the current position of uh, the current difference between our head position and the apple position in both the I, uh, x and y coordinates. And then we need an int try diff x and int try diff y, which is going to be, the, again, the difference between the apple uh, uh, x and y, but in relation to our new head position, our, our new example, our, our try state, our new sort of moved left, move forward, move right state. And now how do we work these out? Well, there's various ways to work to work these out. But we've got a bit of a problem here. I shall explain the nature of the problem and why we have to do this in a, in a clever way. So if our head is here and the apple is over here, so let's give some coordinates to this. So the head is at three, three, and the apple's at six, six. Well, to work out the difference between them, the difference in say the x coordinate, we have to do six minus three, don't we? If we do three minus six, we get a, a, the wrong value. So we have to do six minus three. <laughs> but what if they're the other way around? So what if the uh, what if the head's there and the apple's there? And the coordinates are the same, so we've got three, three, six, six. Well, we have to do the the same thing as the other way around. Again, we can't just do three minus six because we end up with a minus value. So we can solve this in two ways. We can do um, we can do a series of if statements. We can do if the head's at a lower position, the apple do it this way around. If not, do it the other way around. We can use a ternary operator and make that a really shorthand way, which would probably be my preferred way. But because this is just an example, we're going to do it the, the shortest hand way possible. And we're going to use something called an abs function, which is an absolute function. So it gives an absolute value. So we're going to do um, diff x equals abs head dot x minus apple dot x. And that shouldn't be a dot, that should be a, an arrow. So we're going to minus the head x off the apple x and we're running it in this abs function to make sure that we always get a positive value basically. Abs um, head y minus apple dot y. And then for this we can do the same thing again. We can do, this time we do try x minus apple x. And then we do abs try y minus apple dot y. Now it's just giving us an absolute value. We've missed the equal signs off there, haven't we? And that'll give us the difference, well, the, the distance between the apple's x position and the uh, head's x position, and then the apple's y position, the head's y position. And we can compare that to our new try value, our try position, uh, again, in relation to the apple, and see if which one's bigger. And if the... Um, if our new try state, if this has moved us closer to the apple, we want to give a reward. Or if this has moved us closer to the apple, we want to give a small reward, don't we? So we can do, do that in if statements, can't we? We need another two ifs again, because we've got two coordinates. So we can do if diff x is greater than, tr oh, we want to do it the other way around. If try diff x is less than diff x, we're going to give a small reward, plus equals 5. And then we can do the same thing for the y, if try diff y is less than diff y, we can do reward plus equals 5. So all we've done is worked out the difference between the head and the apple and then the new try position and the apple. If the try position is puts us closer to the apple, we're just going to give a plus 5 reward and we're going to have to put a 5 in there, aren't we? Let's see if it works. And it does. We're now heading towards the apple. Simple. <laughs> the game's actually playing itself now. It's not perfect yet. There's a, let's 
give it a few seconds and see if it actually does it. Well, what we're getting up to, it might take ages. We could crash into ourselves. We're not checking that we don't crash into ourselves, are we? It'd be nice to actually see it do, do it. Now, there we go, it happened. We crashed into ourselves. So we wanna make sure that we don't crash into ourselves. So we need to detect tail. And for this, we're gonna to have to while through all the segments of the snake and see if our try X and try Y are at the same coordinates as any of the positions on the snake. Nice and simple. So we've already done this several times. Um, if, if, you, if you have watched the previous video of building snake, we've done this for detecting all kinds that crashed into ourselves. So we, all we do is we make um, a track, make it equal to the head, and then we wanna move, we don't want to check um, do we want to no, we don't want to check the head. We can't crash a head into a head. So we do if track next is not equal to null, track equals track next. And then we while through the remainder. Track is not equal to null. I am gonna go through linked lists uh, extensively. We haven't covered that yet in the um, in this series, and um, we will do. Very handy uh, data structure, a linked list, because they're easy to work with once you've set them up. It takes a bit of work to set up at something like a linked list, but once you've got it set up, it's very powerful, and you can use it for lots of things. And uh, they're sort of like what you might call um, derivatives of linked lists like circular buffers which are massively useful especially in audio programming but they're useful for lots of things it's surprising how many times I've used a circular buffer for a really simple solution to a problem that without a circular buffer would have been difficult to solve right so all we need to do is do an if and we just need to do a big negative reward if our try x equals um, track x and try y equals track y we're going to do reward minus plus equals minus 100. in this situation i found it's best just to do plus equals and everything and use negative values otherwise it gets a bit confusing as to what we're doing right that should do it all being well now we shouldn't crash into ourselves because if we're ever in a state where our try position is inside the snake, we're just gonna, not gonna turn in that direction. And here we are. We've made an AI to play snake in two functions. Well, we got a turn left and a turn right function. And surprisingly, this is a very good AI. This works really well. On a grid size of this, we can get scores of about 50. If we leave it for a while. Play for it. It'll play for ages, won't it? The only time it ever gets stuck is this. And it managed to get out that time because it kind of follows itself. But it enters um, it, if it gets trapped in its own tail and it can't get out. Yep, there we go. That's the only time it dies now. That's literally the only situation it ever dies. And that's a really hard problem to solve, as, uh, as I've discovered. You need Hamiltonian cycle to solve that problem, but then you're not really doing AI anymore. You're just doing a graphing algorithm like a traveling salesman algorithm, and um, there's no, no thinking involved. I like this method a lot because it's sort of biological in nature. It's one of the reasons why I like neural networks so much. It's kind of uh, based on biology. So uh, in your brain, you have like... Um, Dopamine, don't you? you have, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on biology, but you have pain receptors and you have dopamine, which is like a reward uh, chemical that gets released into your brain. And um, we're kind of modeling this AI on that kind of same basic principle. Uh, this is sort of a negative reward and here we have a positive reward. And then the uh, AI is making decisions on what's gonna get it's the best reward. To, uh, see this in action we can speed things up let's um so we have a sdl delay to set the speed let's make that an actual define delay and we'll set it to 20. let's make the grid size a bit bigger make grid size of 28. it plays it really quickly doesn't it 
because there's not a lot of computation going on. Those functions are quite simple. It's a big switch statement, but a computer falls through a, a program falls through a, flip through a switch statement really quickly because it obviously ignores all the cases that it doesn't do. So what time are we on? Well, it only means 30 minutes, 30 minutes in. I thought it was going to take about an hour. I think I'll just carry on and try and make this game look a bit better. It doesn't look very good, does it? And maybe talk a little bit more about neural networks at the end and how we can do the same thing with a neural network and how we're still kind of stuck with the same problem of dropping our own tail. So, where's our render snake? Render snake, what I want is this the uh, segments to actually look segmented rather than just all together. So if we make that minus two and then we offset the position by plus one. That should segment the snake. I'm going to have to slow it down to see it. Put that back to 80. So now we've got a segmented snake. You can actually see the gaps. We can make that look even better actually. If we do, I'm going to vary the color a little bit, but we want it to sort of oscillate. So we're going to need int bright equals 255, int bdir equals 0. We're going to bring our color into the loop because we're going to change it. this to be set to bright and then we want to oscillate that value so we can do it after the track we can do if bdir equals zero bright minus equals five if bright is less than 150 BDIR equals one. I won't explain all this because it's a bit boring, but if BDIR equals one, bright plus equals five, if bright is greater than 250, BDIR equals zero. That should oscillate our snake color a little bit. Might be a bit hard to see until it gets long. I've already tried this out, you see, and uh, I like the results I got. Especially when the snake gets really long, you can kind of see it all moving. It sort of looks a bit more slithery, like a snake should look. You can see the colours are a little bit different. I'm not varying very much, but they're a little bit different. I think I did something else once when I made this. I've had a few run-throughs of making this game because I've made it for a neural network. I even made the Hamiltonian cycle version, which is just not interesting to watch. <laughs> it's like the, you just calculate. Do you know what Hamiltonian cycle is? Um, it's is an algorithm that works out. So you've got this grid of squares. It works out um, a path that visits every square at least once. And if the snake just follows that path, it never crashes into itself. And uh, it's, not, it's not actually going for the apple or anything. It just goes round and round and round and eventually completes the game. But that's not an AI, is it? That's just an algorithm. That's just a graphing algorithm. That's figuring out uh, a root, a root finding graphing algorithm. So what I want to do is do another seg. So we do 3yy, we'll call this seg outline, seg outline. And we'll get rid of the minuses and we're going to render this first a different color. So we're going to do, where's our fill rect? make this blue instead. And we're going to have to also
set the uh, x and y position. Right there. I, know, I mean, you can barely see the difference, but there's like blue blue square going around the um, each green one. I thought it looked quite good. I also had an idea for the border. Let's do my idea for the border. I haven't done this yet, so let's find out if it looks good. I want to make it look a bit more like an arcade game than just like a boring, you know, like a program. It'll make it look like an actual game. Where's the render grid gone? Right. So here's what I was thinking. So if we do a for loop around this. And we can do um, i is less than 255, i plus plus. We want to render lots of these. I want to vary the alpha channel. We're going to have to set a blend mode. Let's be render it. How would you set a blend mode again? It's SDL render set render draw blend mode I think yeah perfect and then we want blend mode blend in typical library style render that should give us an ability to vary our alpha channel you know what an alpha channel is is where we can set the opacity so we can make things sort of um, more ghosted out we're going to need this there aren't we we're going to need to put that in the loop so i want to make it like um if you do web program i'm going to make a box shadow effect which means we want to do this 255 minus i we want this to get bigger with every iteration so we want this to be minus i this to be minus i and this to be plus i although we have to plus i on each side don't we so it's going to be plus i i there we go that's exactly ex first time i don't like the color not, oh, it's because I haven't got it set to full blue, have we? I was thinking more of making it like just a normal blue. We could even change this as well, couldn't we? Make it sort of fade to black. There we go, arcade snake. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? We could make it like psychedelic. How do we do that? We could equals rand modulus two five five <laughs> That's a little bit crazy than I was expecting. I know why it is because I was meant to do this. Meant to put that outside the loop. Which is still crazy. <laughs> You're still mental. You couldn't play in a game like that. You make like a handicap snake where you've got loads of stuff going on the screen that's distracting you from your concentration and making it really hard to play the game. That's not going to work, is it? We can't do that. <laughs> we could. Should we do them both? We'll just see what it looks like if we change both these. Yeah, it sort of fades to white. We need another value, don't we? We need an R2, which is going to be a different value. There we go. <laughs> anyway, let's get rid of that. <laughs> Make sure it's back to normal. Right, yeah, that's what I was thinking. What we really need is a counter, don't we? We need to be able to, um, we need to know how much, um, 
how much time have we got left? Well, I mean, I can make this video as long as I want, can't I? I kind of thought I might do it for an hour. Let's make a counter. Right. Do you know how to make uh, render glyphs in, uh, in, in STL? It's not easy because, um, I mean, we can import true type fonts and all those kinds of things, but that's quite a lot of lines of code to do that. And uh, it's all just library functions, so it's not very interesting. So we'll do it the glyph way. So we're going to make another file. Glyphs. Let's make a glyph.c. I already made one. Oh, yeah, I used it before, didn't I? In my previous example. Well, that's going to save us a bit of time. So basically what we've done is we've made a two three dimensional um, character array called glyphs of zero, one, two, um, three and four and so on. So we've got all the different numbers and uh, we've just basically drawn the numbers out in ones. So we're, we're going to render a square if it's a one and we're going to ignore it if it's a zero in a, in a sort of like matrix. That saves us it. It's going to take no time at all there. So we're going to have to include that though, aren't we? Glyph.c, make sure that compiles. Yeah. So we're going to want to render the score. We're going to have to take the SDL, render it. This is a bit tricky to do actually. I have done this kind of thing a lot. So we need STL set render draw color renderer start with green. We're going to need STL. Let's figure out where we're going to put it first. So let's do STL. Um, rect out out dot width equals a hundred out dot height equals a hundred out dot x equals x out dot y equals y. We're obviously passing the x and y parameters and we're just going to draw that. STL render draw rect render address of out. Let's call that function down here. Render score, but we don't want that to be grid X and grid Y. Let's put it in the top corner and make sure everything is working. So yeah, we've got a score. Should we put it up there? Kind of want it to be in the middle somewhere. So we want the X position to be window width divide two there, because that's going to offset a little bit. We also want to make sure we render the score after we've rendered the grid otherwise we're not going to be able to see it there we go knock it back a little bit eh? minus 100 yeah it's gonna to have to be bigger than that though isn't it so yeah. well it doesn't really matter this is just a temporary box so there we shall we put the score there i reckon so We're going to need a score first of all, aren't we? If we're going to render a score, so I reckon we put that in the apple because we are collecting apples, aren't we? In score, and where's our main function? So we're going to initialize that to apple dot score equals zero. We we'll start at a score of zero. There's our gen apple. There we go. Every time we generate an apple, we're going to do apple dot score plus plus. Is this a void function? It should have a return, shouldn't it? Yeah. Return. And then when we reset the snake, reset the snake, we can do apple.score equals zero. So we just need to render the apple score now. Where's our... Render score, right. You know what? We're going to render a 
high score as well. Or top, should we call it a top score? Let's render a top score as well. And that means we need to. There's our reset snake. Before we do that, if apple.score is greater than top score, no, apple.top score, apple.top score equals apple.score. I'll do this make sure I've not made any mistakes. Yep, fine. Which means we need to render the score and render the high score as well. So I'm going to have to double up this function, but we'll get one working first. So well, we can just get rid of that, can't we? Let's do STL rect cell cell dot width equals. Let's make a cell size int cell size equals nine. I equals cell size and then we're gonna to have to work out the X and Y positions as we go and we're gonna do that in a loop and we're gonna to have to have our score is gonna to have to be copied into a character buffer so we're gonna need a car buff say size 10 and we're gonna to have to SN printf the buff the size of buff the Percent 3D. Could we make a big a big grid? We might end up in the thousands on the score. I sincerely doubt our AI is going to get that far, but we're going to have to copy the Apple score into that, aren't we? So int k equals zero. K is less than four. K plus plus. And then we're going to need a, a loop inside that, and then another loop inside that because we've got x and y coordinates for our glyphs. I think equals zero i is less than nine. I think the glyphs are i plus plus. J equals zero. J is less than nine. J plus plus. And then we're going to do if. Cell dot x equals x plus cell size times i plus cell size times 9 times k. We can drop that bit for the y, can't we? Not now, cat. We're almost rendering a score. That needs to be a J. STL render fill rect render address of cell and this just needs to be if glyphs K J I. What do you reckon? Will that work? Five, five, three. Five, six, one. And we've got a score. Right, that worked. So I shall go through how to do that sometime. Obviously I didn't go through that, I just wanted to get it done as quickly as possible. Check this out, Cap. We've got a uh, AI playing Snake all on its own. So let's render the top score. We can literally just copy and paste this function. Get rid of all the white space. Um, 27YY. Render, render top score. We need to change it a bit though, don't we?
Where's our render score? Render top score, and we want to. Where shall we put it? Let's put it over the other side. Plus 200. There we go. We don't want them to be the same color, otherwise, it's going to get confusing. Yeah, comfortable cat. What color shall we make these? Let's make them yellow. Top score like it's golden. Right, there we go. We've got arcade style snake now. One more change to that. I want these to be minus two, I reckon. Similar to the snake, so we don't quite so they don't quite join up. There we go. So they look a bit more like digital style. Right, let's experiment. Let's make the speed five and the size eighty-eight. See what score we get. <laughs> so going back to the AI that we made, really simple AI, just a reward-based AI. Here we are playing in real time. Oh, we died then quite early on. Score of thirty-five. What's up, cat? What do you want? The snake kind of looks blue now. I think the ratio of the outline that I made to the snake. Well, it kind of looks mint green, actually, doesn't it? And quite a good score here. 76, 77. Don't walk on my keyboard, cat. We've got over 100. Oh, we've got 106. AI-powered snake. Score of 106. going to make one more arcade style change that I've already done before so I'll do it quick. I'm going to slow this down to 20. Grid size back to 28. We're going to make a, where's our render snake? That's quite a big function now that isn't it? You have to zoom out. Zoom out a little bit too far there haven't I? 55. We're going to make a flash snake. Flash snake. And what we are going to do is we are going to do int r equals rand modulus 255 gb. And we are going to do r. G B right in fact we'll just leave that one as it is we'll just change the main block to R G B probably don't need to change the bright actually we are flashing the snake aren't we and then because now we've got a score we can do Render snake there. If apple dot score modulus ten equals zero and apple dot score is not equal to zero flash equals 10 so we're going to need to set a flash up here if 
clash is greater than zero, we're gonna do minus the render snake. We're gonna flash the snake, and then we're gonna do flash minus minus. See if that works. And the snake flashes down when we get to 10 or 20 or 30, every 10, to give it more of an arcade feel to it. This all looks quite good. First time I was on this border thing, I've obviously done the numbers bit before. Although I didn't segment them last time, so I've moved to more of a segmented style in my uh, snake game makings. Good thing about making your own programs is you can do things like this. Let's do a grid size of 128 and a speed of 1. A delay of 1. And a tiny little snake on a giant board. <laughs> Moving as fast as it can move. Wonder what score we get to. The bigger the board, the better scores you're going to get because the um, the situation where it dies is if it wraps itself in its own tail, and that happens when an apple sort of is generated behind where it is and it turns back on itself. You can kind of cheat the game a little bit and always get 108. Always generate an apple sort of in front of the snake's position, and it looks like it's doing really well, but it is cheating. Good score here. Surprised how blue the snake looks when it gets small. Looks really cool when it gets all wrapped up and gets out of itself again. So we've not just made AI 193, we've not just made AI snake, we've made AI um, arcade style snake. Anyway, I was going to wear all this, so let's go back to a normal looking 28 and a delay of 25. So it's basically a perfect AI apart from one situation which is trapping itself in its own tail. So how do you solve the problem of making it so it doesn't trap itself in its own tail? I've tried about 20 ways of doing this and it, um, we call this style of AI Q learning and um, I'm guessing it's not possible. I've looked at other people's examples on the internet and everyone seems to come to the same conclusion now the only way to make an AI complete the game is using these Hamiltonian cycles which isn't an AI at all. Because even if I do it with a neural network I'll show it with it. I've made a neural network that learns to um, do exactly what we've just been doing there. Basically, we're training it, we're doing it in a slightly different way. Now, the, the game's being played by exactly the same method we've just programmed there. Now, what we're feeding in is environment variables. Let's have a look at the environment variables. Oh. We're feeding in a load of Boolean values, basically. Danger forward, danger left, danger right. Direction up, direction down, direction left, direction right, apple up, apple down, apple left, apple right. And uh, we've got these Q values as well, but uh, we're not feeding them into the neural network. So we're just feeding those values and you can see them flashing them out as the snake moves around. Um, if the apple's to the left of it, the apple left will be one, otherwise it'll be zero. So these are all ones and zeros that are getting fed into this neural network and we're outputting go forward, turn left, turn right. Nice and simple. And it takes ages to train. If I mean, if I turn off the uh, Q learning now, it either just stays in the middle and just continually goes around in a circle and doesn't try and get the apple, or it um, 
continually crashes into the wall. It takes a while for these values to settle down and actually become um, to, be, to, to represent playing the game. But ultimately, it gets to the same point. We're using the reason I've got this bash top loaded up here is just to see how much computing power we're using to to do all these calculations for this neural network. And we get to the same point where it, it still doesn't um, do very well on the game. Now I've not Bellman equation this, so there's a Bellman equation you can use to where you're sort of trying to maximize your future reward um, updating a Q table. And uh, I won't explain it all here because um, I mean, I'll probably go through how to program it rather than just try and explain it on the fly. But I guess the thinking is, if I massively increase the number of neurons and sort of put that Bellman um, equation in, that the neural network will sort of figure out in time. There's enough. If there's enough parameters, it'll figure out not to trap its own tail or something like that. It'll, it'll get better. It'll get better. It'll make improved results. But it still won't complete the game as I understand it. Now, I've not left this running for long enough to figure that out. But um, the problem with giving it loads of neurons, I don't have a massively powerful laptop. Well, I have. I've got a pretty powerful laptop. But even a pretty powerful laptop is not enough for a powerful neural network. If we add in a, a layer of 32 neurons there and a layer of 32 neurons there and have a look at how this works. Yeah, it looks quite cool. We've got absolutely tons and tons of neurons. And uh, it's going to take absolutely ages to train on the training method I'm using at the moment. But... Um, it's quite cool watching a neural network flick around and do its thing when you're doing this kind of style of learning for it. Trying to find a configuration. It's con continually reconfiguring itself to match the training data. But we're using like 95%, uh, this is not multi-threaded, we're using, well basically 100% of a processor all the time and it slowed the game down massively. And I still don't think it's going to um, be able to complete the game. For the last week I've thought about very little else apart from how I can get this neural network to be able to complete Snake. I mean, th th coming up with my own um, graphing algorithms. If anybody knows, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure no one's going to be watching a um, zero to neural networks if you know the answer to these kind of questions, because you probably already know and you don't need to... to um, to follow along with this kind of channel. But if anyone just happens to know of a non-Hamiltonian way that I can use a neural network to complete Snake. I was thinking um, what I need is a boxing algorithm. So if I can convert the state of the game into a graph very quickly, very computationally efficiently, just of like ones and zeros and maybe 0.5 to represent the apple. And then in that situation there where we've made a box, all you've got to do is figure out if inside that box there's an, enough room to fit the entire snake. And uh, if there isn't, we give a massive negative reward for turning into the box. And I was thinking about doing it like that and then uh, we don't need the neural network. We can just do it with a uh, Q learning. If I turn off the Q learning now, I don't think it's turned off yet. Oh, I think it's playing it, actually. And it does appear to have learned the game. Try it again. So there we go. This is a neural network playing snake. We are live playing snake now. And it plays it just like it's playing the q learning, but it still gets itself trapped. It still gets itself trapped. <laughs> it does. It makes the same decisions as the q learning method. We've got some big biases going on here, very biased neurons. The big, the glowing parts represent the biases of the neurons. Anyway, so that's enough of that. So it doesn't, the neural network doesn't do, it might do a little bit better, but it doesn't do much better than this because it's got no awareness of the idea of not trapping its own tail. I'm not putting that into the network in the first place. And I was thinking about what kind of inputs, and this is the thing about neural networks, you've got to really think, think through your inputs and your outputs. There's obvious ways to, um, 
to feed in that awareness into the neural network. We can feed in the entire grid, but on a 14 by 14 grid, that's 768 inputs we've got to feed into the neural network, which is going to slow things down and require a massive amount of computing power to be able to figure that out. I have to say this, getting it, do, learning reinforcement learning has turned out to be about 50 times more interesting than I was expecting it to be. I've done no reinforcement learning up until this point. I've been really concentrating on, um, you know, well, at first all I just wanted to do was be able to build neural networks in C and that took long enough, that took months. And then figuring out better ways of doing it and eventually implementing, doing my own back propagation algorithm from scratch was a tough challenge. And then I got really into using that neural network to learn image data and um, interpolating different images and that kind of thing. And I'm massively into the idea of audio-based AI. But what, what I want is to build my own um, natural language processor and get into that kind of thing. And that the beginning of that is reinforcement learning, really. It's, well, kind of. You have to know quite, you know, it needs to tokenize the rules of language for natural language. Pro I've not built my own um, natural language processor yet. And uh, I guess this is a step towards doing that. I've done loads of interesting things with image data. But I'm a bit bored of just doing image data. I mean, I'm going to go through it all in this series. So uh, we'll get to go through using neural networks to um, do image data. I've not got as far as doing their Gaussian diffusion yet, but. I understand the basic principles and I reckon I could program it um, pretty quick. So, Although having said that, I bet it's more complicated than I actually think right now. This turned out to be more complicated than I first thought it was going to be. Well, more interesting anyway. I think those numbers need to be bigger at the top there. Let's make one final change to our game here. Before we call it a day on this video. We just need to change the cell size and make it 11. We don't want to go too massive, do we? Same with this. There we go. So this wasn't really an installment in um, Zero to Neural Networks. This was just a, an update on where I'm on with my um, reinforcement learning and this is surprisingly easy if you go back to the start of this video you'll, you'll see that it's not that difficult to make a snake game play itself with what we call Q learning without even using any Bellman equation or anything or any of the methods that you, you'll see on the internet just simple rewards giving rewards for going in the right direction and negative reward for going in the wrong direction by testing out their expected next state You know, no complicated maths or anything, and it plays the game just fine. And we get to the problem that we get with every other method apart from the Hamiltonian cycle method. I had loads of videos planned for this week, but I've had a bit of a cold. And um, I've been able to do programming, but talking through things, I thought it wouldn't come across very well if I was all like, you know, cold, colded up <laughs> trying to do that. So I've had to... Um, postpone everything. I was going to go through pointers this week and have a good crack at explaining pointers. But we'll have to save that for, um, well, I'm back to normal now, so the next few days, probably. I shall set a challenge, though. I'll finish on a challenge. So, let's go back to our state. So we've got a nice, easy we're always going to have three states in a in a snake game we're going to have and we can try forward try left try right it's, it's going to you can do this in a different way if you want but you're going to end up with a very similar solution and we can do various things that involve giving rewards so the challenge is to um concoct rewards that give better um better scores so we're going to have to set parameters to the challenge because as we've seen if we make a bigger scoreboard we, if we make a bigger snake board we get bigger scores so You've got a grid size of 28. What's the best score you can get on a grid size of 28? Using this method. If anybody out there can... I think I get about... If I run this game really quickly. 
we drop this down to two. We can just leave it running for a bit and see what score it gets highest of 30, 46. I can get about high 70s is about the best score I've seen on a grid size of 28. In fact, I think once I went over 100, I think I had like 101 or something. Yeah, that was like a complete one-off. I've not seen anything near that since. Be interesting to see if there's a, a way to get a high score without using any other complex maths or any other difficult methods, just with creating better rewards. Because it comes down to one extra reward, which is um, don't trap yourself in a box. I've tried all different kinds of, I've, I've come up with loads and none of them have helped. This is a big score. There you go, 93. So every now and again you do get a decent size score on a, on a grid size of 28. I did one method where it was, um, I always moved away, I gave a reward for moving away from the majority of the snake. So every single time we did a state, we, uh, uh, we did a state, we, from the position of the head, um, if most of the rest of the tail was to the left of it, I gave a reward to the right. <laughs> and if most of the rest of the tail was in front of it, I gave a reward to the left or the right. You know what I mean? You get the idea. So I'm always moving away from where the majority of the snake is. And uh, I was convinced that that was going to do it. And uh, it actually didn't help at all. <laughs> and it took quite a while to write that. That was quite a big algorithm to write. I tried one where... Um, something about I tried to make it so it never touched its own tail and that just create, created unusual results so I was like never ever connect with your own tail but then it just spiralled into a box <laughs> rather than going along its own so that didn't help and I was sure that was going to work as well right that's over an hour isn't it let's call it a day so I get a score of 93 proven there on a grid size of 28. Can anyone do any better than that? You can't use any other methods. <laughs> you can't you can't use any uh, um you know you have to well I say you can use other methods. You can come up with you know graphing algorithms, just not Hamiltonian cycle. You can't use Hamiltonian cycle. And you've got to use this basic Q-learning approach. What's the highest score you can get on a grid size of 28? Challenge on. <laughs> right. Um, I will see you next time. I've got a load of videos that I haven't made that I need to uh, catch up on because now I'm feeling better. So um, I will see you next time for more C programming. Uh, Zero to Neural Networks. Goodbye.